Hello, I'm Dr. Richard McClary and I teach Islamic art in the History of Art Department here at York. And it's uh, my great delight to event welcome you to this event, which is part of the York Islamic Art Circle, which is a collaboration between the University of York's Islamic Society and Department of the History of Art, and is presented within the York Festival of Ideas. It's with great delight that I can introduce Dr. Farouk Yahya, a research associate in the department of the History of Art and Archaeology in the School of the Arts at SOAS University of London. His research interests include the Islamic arts of the book, as well as texts and images relating to magic and divination, particularly in Southeast Asia. He is the author of Magic and Divination in Malay Illustrated Manuscripts, published by Brill in 2016, and editor of the Arts of Southeast Asia from the SOAS Collection, published in Penang in 2017, his latest book is the co-edited volume Islamicate Occult Sciences in Theory and Practice, again published by Brill this year in 2021. He's going to speak to us about Malay magic and divination manuscripts. And so with no further ado, I'll hand you over to Farouk. Thank you very much, Farouk. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for your very kind introduction. Uh, I'm very grateful for the uh, York Islamic Art Circle and the York Festival of Ideas for inviting me to give this talk today and for organizing this event. Um, so hello everyone, um, my name is Farouk Yahya. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, one of my main areas of research, which is on uh, Malay magic and divination manuscripts. So for my research, I've looked at almost 100 manuscripts uh, from the Malay area, which encompasses the uh, Malay Peninsula, which includes Southern Thailand, Peninsula Malaysia and Singapore, um, as well as the coastal areas of Sumatra and Borneo. Now note that Malay was used as lingua franca within the broader region of Southeast Asia. So Malay manuscripts could also come from other parts of the region, such as in Java, Sulawesi and the Philippines. And these manuscripts date from the late 18th century up to the early 20th century. So just to give you a quick background of the region, um, from the early first millennium AD, Southeast Asia began to adopt uh, various elements of Indic culture, such as in terms of religion, such as the adoption of Hinduism and Buddhism, and also in the terms of the written tradition. Uh, for example, Indic derived scripts were used as well as in the use of the palm leaf format for manuscripts. Now from the 13th century uh, onwards, Islam was formally adopted initially by the kingdoms in the northern area of Sumatra, and then gradually uh, spread across the rest of uh, maritime Southeast Asia. So now when Islam arrived, uh, some elements of Islamic art and architecture and traditions were localized to suit the local culture as can be seen, for example, in the architecture of mosques and also in the decoration used to illuminate Quran manuscripts. Now, the arrival of Islam also brought the Islamic written culture. 
So Malay began to be written in the form of Arabic script known as Jawi and it's read from right to left. Um, and also in terms of books, they were made from paper and they're made in the form of the codex format, so it, like in the modern day book, basically. There are also other formats like scrolls and folding books. Now, in terms of date, the majority of surviving Malay manuscripts, or indeed most Southeast Asian manuscripts in general, like Javanese and Burmese, only date from the late 18th century up to the early 20th century. Uh, there's a few which are older, but they're quite rare. And this is because the hot and humid climate of the region, uh, together with you know, insects and termites, natural disasters and fire, means that uh, early manuscripts in Southeast Asia have generally not survived. Uh, nevertheless, we know that the Malay manuscript tradition appears to be a long-standing one, and the texts contained in these manuscripts uh, cover a broad range of topics, including religion, history, literature, legal codes, uh, medicine, and so on. Now, my focus today is on manuscripts relating to magic and divination. Now, defining both uh, magic and divination is quite complex and uh, difficult, uh, but for the present purposes, um, I'm going to use um, Professor Emily Savage Smith's uh, definition of magic as an act that seeks to alter the course of events, usually by calling upon a superhuman force, most often God or one of his intercessors, uh, and for divination as attempts to predict future events or gain information about things unseen, but not necessarily to alter them. So therefore, I look at magic as covering things like spells, talismans, uh, incantations, amulets, uh, and so on, while divination covers things like astrology, numerology, uh, reading omens, lot casting, and, and that, that sort of thing. Now, in Islam, um, there are beneficent and maleficent beings and forces in the cosmos who have the power to help or harm human beings. Now, first and foremost is God or Allah, who is the creator and has the power of all things, and there are also other beings and forces that can have an effect on human life. So angels, prophets, and saints can act as intercessors to God for help in healing and protection, while we have also have demons, uh, jinn, and spirits who may cause illness and harm. There's also some objects and places that can have power, such as planets in the case of astrology. Now, another thing to bear in mind is that uh, the Islamic world is not a single monolithic block, but instead there are many variations in regard to geographical region and also time period. For example, in Southeast Asia, there are local saints, spirits, mythical animals and supernatural forces that were believed to inhabit the universe. For instance, the image on the left here shows uh, two evil spirits. Uh, and this, this is from a manuscript uh, from Malacca, which is located there, uh, datable to around 1845. Uh, while the drawing on the right is from a manuscript uh, from the Malay Peninsula to the 19th century, uh, which shows a demon which uh, causes menstrual cramps or sungugut. Now, there are various magical and divinatory techniques that can be used to help deal with these beings and forces. Uh, some you can do by yourself, such as reciting simple incantations or prayers, while others require the conduct of specialists. The, the techniques to involve various tools such as text, image, images, and objects. For instance, uh, for the spirit on the left here, for the, these two spirits, uh, the text of the manuscript above them uh, say to place these drawings, uh, which you may see are filled in with and surrounded by uh, various sacred texts, to place them above uh, the beds uh, of children so that um, these spirits, apparently according to the text, will be ashamed of looking at these images. Now for the image on the right of these dem demon of menstrual cramps, uh, you draw, according to the text, you draw the figure onto a white bowl, you add water to it, and then the patient uh, drinks it. It must however be emphasized that underlying these practices is the belief that all appeals to health and well-being are ultimately directed towards God, and it is he who has the power to cure and protect. Now, many of these techniques, uh, such as these ones uh, on display here, are recorded in notebooks that were compiled and used by magicians, known in Malay as Bomo or Pawang, but also by physicians and other practitioners of magic, such as religious officials. Now, no two uh, manuscripts have the same content, so they were very much personalized 
and acted as an aid memoir for the practitioner. Also, many of them contain images such as illustrations of human beings, animals, spirits like the ones you see here, uh, diagrams and uh, talismanic designs. Therefore, they're very important for our understanding of Malay art, especially in terms of drawing and painting. As you can see, typically the drawings of uh, living beings and objects in these manuscripts are schematic, two-dimensional, and are not usually anatomically accurate or realistic. Uh, in most cases, the figures are depicted singly without any background or landscape elements and often without uh, frames. Now, this manuscript uh, here, which is in the SOAS collection, statable to the 1830s to 1840s, once belonged to a royal magician from Perak uh, in Malaysia. Perak is located there. Now, during the 19th century, the Malay, Malay royal courts often employed magicians who were in charge of the spiritual and supernatural issues relating to the kingdom. The contents of this manuscript, uh, however, indicate that the man interest of the Perak royal magician did not differ greatly from practitioners who served the general public. About half of its 83 chapters and sections are concerned with healing, including treatment for illnesses such as fevers and eye disease, as well as those that were caused by spirits. The rest of the chapters are to do with love magic, such as how to attract women and how to enhance uh, one's attractiveness, and also on war magic, such as how to protect yourself against enemies. An example of the latter can be seen in the page on the left-hand side here. Here's a close-up of the uh, talisman, which um, could be used to protect uh, oneself against evil spirits, as well as enemies during battle. So it is in the form of two oval or shield-like shapes, and within these shapes are various Arabic letters and numbers. Now, the meaning of these uh, letters and numbers uh, have yet to be deciphered, but they include, for instance, the words for God, Allah, which is in the third line and the top uh, shape, and also Muhammad, which is underneath that. Meanwhile, uh, on the right hand side of the page at the bottom here is a treatment for dizziness. It includes, uh, it involves writing a magic formula on a piece of paper, which is then soaked in some sort of liquid. Uh, I can't decipher what the liquid uh, is. And then some of this liquid is then smeared onto the patient's face. So the magic formula consists of the names of God Allah, which is uh, on the right hand side, and the numbers, the number three repeated three times. And between all this are a series of four five pointed stars known as pentagrams. So the pentagram uh, is an ancient symbol which is already in use um, since the time of the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians, and also employed in the West as a powerful uh, magical tool. There's also the hexagram, which is a six-pointed star. Now, within the Jewish tradition, the pentagram and the hexagram uh, are known as the shield of David, while in Islam, they're referred to as Solomon's seal. This is in reference to the ring owned by Solomon, who had control over animals, birds, and jinn. It is also found in the West, as I mentioned, such as in this book of spells, owned by a cunning man or folk healer uh, from Yorkshire, where the hexagram is found uh, in a spell for use against witchcraft. So it's over there on the right hand side page. In Southeast Asia, the pentagram and the hexagram are also found on numerous objects, such as in this talismanic textile. Here, the hexagram is in the middle of the textile and it's filled with uh, various numbers. On its right is the Quranic verse, and on its left is the Islamic proclamation of faith, the Shahada. On the left and right ends of the textile is a design known as the magic square. Now, the magic square is a square grid containing numbers that arrange in such a way that each uh, row, each column, and the two main diagonals would give you the same sum. 
Now, the simplest and smallest magic square is a three by three square containing the numbers one to nine, uh, so that the sum of each row, column, and two main diagonals equals 15. So they can be bigger than this. You can have a four by four magic square where the sum of each row, column, and two main diagonals is 34. In fact, you can have them even bigger uh, than that. Now, scholars believe that the magic square originated from China, where the three by three magic square is known as the Luo Shu or document of the Low River. Tradition attributes the magic square to the Emperor Yu around 23rd century BC, and the emperor was charged with the task of controlling devastating floods. And he reportedly saw dots on the back of a sacred turtle in the Low River. The number of dots on the back of the turtle were arranged as per the magic square. The magic square then spread across the world, including in Middle East, India, and also Europe, such as can be seen in this engraving by Abrek Dura, where you can see at the back uh, top uh, right hand corner of this print is a four by four magic square. Now magic squares began to appear in the Islamic world by the ninth century. And because of its uh, mathematical properties, it is discussed in mathematical treatises. But the magic square was also often used as talismans, such as uh, in cases to do with uh, facilitating childbirth. It is found, for instance, in one of the oldest Arabic treatises on medicine and natural philosophy, titled uh, Firdaus al-Hikmah, or the Paradise of Wisdom, composed by a Persian um, physician named uh, Tabari around 850 AD. The three by three magic square appears in a prescription uh, for facilitating childbirth, which is in this manuscript here. The text says to draw the magic square on two pieces of pottery from a new earthenware jug or jar, never touched by water, and on each of them, you draw the magic square. These are then brought to the woman so that she gazes intently at the writing on them, and then you place them under her feet. Now we find similar prescriptions in Malay manuscripts. This manuscript here is in a private collection in Indonesia and it most likely originates from uh, Palembang in uh, Southern Sumatra. Here, the three by three magic square is also used uh, to help uh, facilitate childbirth. It is to be written on a white bowl, which is filled with water and then drunk by the woman who is having difficulty uh, giving birth. Now this practice of writing sacred texts designs onto a vessel, filling it with liquids and having a person drink it is a common form of Islamic healing. The text or designs can be written with ink or other substances such as saffron, but they're also ready-made metal bowls in which they have been readily inscribed. Such bowls are known in the Islamic world from at least the 12th century. So here's an example uh, in the VNA. You can see various magic squares on the uh, outer side of the bowl and also various uh, sacred texts um, on the surface. At the same time, porcelain magic medicinal bowls were also made in China during the 18th and 19th centuries for export to Muslim markets, including Southeast Asia. This one has a four by four uh, square at the bottom and around the rim are usually Quranic verses and prayers. Apart from numbers, texts are also considered to be powerful. For Muslims, the most powerful text is the Quran. The Quran is the word of God, which was transmitted to the prophet Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. It is therefore the most sacred text for Muslims. It is recited frequently and used in religious rituals, such as in prayers. It is believed to have power and beneficial properties, and so is often employed for purposes such as protection and healing. Now, apart from numbers, texts are also considered to be powerful. For Muslims, the most powerful text is the Quran. Now, the Quran is the word of God, which was transmitted to the Prophet Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. It is therefore the most sacred text for Muslims. 
It is recited frequently and used in religious, religious rituals such as in prayers. It is believed to have power and beneficial properties and so is often employed for purposes such as protection and healing. Now certain chapters and verses of the Quran are considered to be more effective than others for these purposes. One example is uh, verse 13 in chapter 61, uh, the ranks of Surah As-Saf, uh, which reads, help from God and a speedy victory, so give the glad tidings to the believers. And you can find, see it, for example, in this body armor from Iran and the VNA. Now this chapter was revealed after the Prophet Muhammad's emigration or hijrah to Medina, probably soon after the Battle of Uhud, in which the Muslim forces were defeated. Now verse 13 assures uh, Muslims of God's help. So it often appears on objects such as weapons, armor, and banners um, across the Islamic world because it in invokes God's aid in ensuring victory. But it's also found on other types of objects that entail the user seeking help from God, such as those connected with healing and protection. For instance, can be seen in this talismanic textile that I showed earlier in between the, uh, the hexagram and the magic square. Now this manuscript here now in the National Library is probably from either Patani in Southern Thailand or Kelantan in Peninsular Malaysia and datable to the 19th century. Here the Quranic verse, um, chapter 61 verse 13 has been shaped into the form of a feline. So the verse begins with the head of the animal and then continues to the tail and the rump and then the rest of the verse uh, makes up its legs. Now, according to the manuscript, uh, the instructions to the right of hand of the design, it serves to, as a protective function to avoid misfortune upon one's body. Now, this type of design where an image is formed from a text is known as a calligram. Now, calligrams is also known as pictorial uh, calligraphy or figurative calligraphy are texts that have been shaped into figures. They can be composed of any kind of script but in the Islamic tradition, they are typically made from Arabic script. They are found in many parts of the Islamic world and can appear on various media such as paper, textiles, woodwork, and metalwork. And they're still, and they're still very much popular today. The texts that compose the calligrams are almost always religious and mystical, such as Quranic verses, prayers, or the names of holy figures. The choice of images is not random. They are often symbolic and reflect the beliefs and lives of the societies that produce them. Now in the Islamic world, calligrams shaped as lions are probably the most popular. They are often composed of verses praising the Prophet Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law Ali, uh, who was known as a formid formidable warrior and therefore he became known as the Lion of God. So therefore, consequently, this type of calligram in the shape of a lion is known as the Lion of Ali. The earliest dated example uh, of this design is found in a scroll dated 1458, dedicated to the Ottoman ruler Mehmed II. Here, the lion is uh, made up of a text praising uh, Ali, which reads, the victorious Lion of God, Ali ibn Abi Talib, commander of the faithful, may God ennoble his face and be pleased by him. As noted earlier, the motif of the Lion of Ali also appears in Southeast Asia, such as in this manuscript from Patani or Klantan. However, it must be noted that Southeast Asian calligrams of the Lion of Ali design differ from those from other parts of the Islamic world. This is one of the way ways in which it differs is in the choice of the text, because the texts uh, do not relate to Ali at all. Uh, instead, as I mentioned, it's composed of, in this case, composed of a Quranic verse. Uh, it's unclear why um, Southeast Asian calligrams of the Lion Ali deviate um, in that, in that um, case, but it's still something to be investigated. 
Now, the calligram also appears in uh, this Quran from Sumedang in Java, copied in 1856. Uh, Sumedang is located in Java there. So the middle of the Quran uh, contains a double page uh, illuminated uh, illumination um, where within the these triangular shapes above, below, and on the sides of the text block contain uh, the line of Ali design. Here, the calligrams are composed from the Shahada or the Islamic proclamation of faith. There's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Um, this Quran is interesting because um, it relates to the issue of the so-called prohibition of depicting uh, living beings in Islam. So an oft-repeated theory for the production and use of calligrams is that they circumvented the so-called prohibition of depicting living beings. Now, it's often believed that there's no depiction of figural images in Islam, but this is incorrect, as we find many figural images throughout the Islamic world. That said, such representations are typically restricted to the secular sphere. So you would find them, for instance, in palaces, or in illustrated manuscripts on literary and scientific works. But you don't find them in religious contexts, such as in mosques or in copies of the Quran. Therefore, the presence of the calligram here within this Javanese Quran is unusual. On the other hand, the calligram is not the only animal figure in the Javanese religious context. For example, sometimes you find two small lion-like figures that sit at the bottom of the member or pulpit within the mosque, as well as on the doorways of several mausoleums of Javanese saints. Now, this practice is believed to hark back to the Javanese Hindu Buddhist period, when images of mythical creatures such as um, lions and the Naga serpent were acted as guardian figures. So the placement of the line of Ali design in the Quran uh, could be due to the benedictive and protective function of line images. And the calligrams therefore remind us of the variability of positions regarding this matter and how local traditions might have an effect on the use and acceptability of such images. In Southeast Asia, the use of calligrams as magical devices is not restricted to Muslim communities, but it's also found among non-Muslim populations of the region. For instance, a number of talismanic designs used by the Burmese and Shan are in the form of calligrams. This is a calligram of a cow made from Shan script. It is used to instill courage. It is unclear when the Shan uh, began to use calligrams, but they suggest that the power of figural and zoomorphic calligraphy has been recognized uh, through a wide area of Southeast Asia and is part of a long standing, standing tradition. Now, apart from magical rituals, the manuscripts also contain a variety of techniques for divination. Among many Southeast Asian uh, societies, an important concern is to determine when's a correct time to do something, when's the right time for, to go traveling, when's the right time to heal patients, when's the right time to get married and so on. Quite often you will find tables and charts that help you to determine whether, uh, whether a particular time is unlucky or lucky. Uh, for example, here are a couple of calendars on the left hand side, uh, calendars on these wooden panels uh, from Thailand, and on the right is a Balinese calendar. A popular technique for determining auspicious and inauspicious times uh, found in a large number of Malay manuscripts is what is known as the Katika Lima or five times. Uh, this manuscript here is from Singapore uh, dated 18, uh, 1907. Apart from Malay manuscripts, the Katika Lima system has also been found in other parts of Southeast Asia, such as in Java, um, Sulawesi and the Philippines. Now within uh, how this technique works is that um, Within a five day cycle, each day is divided into five time periods, which are morning, forenoon, noon, afternoon, and evening. Because the Jawi script is read from right to left, so the tables here is also from right to left. Now, 
each time period during the day is presided over by a Hindu god. So you have uh, Maheshwara, Shiva, Kala, Sri, Brahma, and Vishnu. And these gods rotate the positions over a cycle of five days. Each god determines the outcome of events or actions during uh, that period, such as whether uh, that time period would be uh, auspicious or otherwise. Now, the first row contains the five time periods or the katika for the first day, the second row contains for the second day and so on. So the cycle begins on the first day of the month. In this example, on the first day, the watch or ruling power in the morning is Maheshwara, forenoon it is Kala, noon it's Sri, afternoon is Brahma, evening is Vishnu. On day two, they rotate the position so that now on day two, uh, Vishnu is now the one in the morning, Maheshwara in forenoon, Kala is noon, afternoon is Sri, and evening is Brahma. And then they rotate again day three, four, and five. And on day six, they go back to the positions as they were on the first day. Each god influences events or actions that were carried over during the time period in which it presides over. The times under Maheshwara and Sri are good, but the times under Kala, Brahma, and Vishnu are bad. Therefore, for things that happen during uh, the watches of Maheshwara, Maheshwara and Sri, the outcome will be good, while those that happen during the other three will be bad. Another way in which the gods affect actions is by their colors. Within this system, each god is associated with a particular color. For Maheshwara, it is white yellow, Sri is white, Kala is black, Brahma is red, and Vishnu is grass green. These colors play a major influence on the outcomes of an action. For example, the color associated with Brahma is red. Therefore, if we were, if we were invited by someone over for a meal, uh, the food that was served to us would be red, such as meat, uh, meat or red colored sweets. If uh, our belongings are stolen, the thief will have red skin or red hair. And illnesses that occur during that time period will be cured uh, with red colored medicine. Now, sometimes in the manuscripts which um, talk about the Katika Lima system, these colors are painted into the tables uh, of the chart. Here you have you can see Kala is painted black, Brahma is painted red, and Vishnu is green. Now, sometimes the colors are not always accurate, uh, might be due to the uh, availability of uh, paints or pigments uh, for the scribe. So example here, Maishwara and Sri are sort of depicted sort of brownish uh, color rather than yellow, white and white respectively. Now, alongside the five times method with the Hindu gods, another system is in use whereby the watches are Islamic prophets and angels. And this is also depicted in the form of a table. This method is known as the Sa'at Lima or five moments. The method is the same as before, where each day in a cycle of five days is divided into five time periods. One, two, three, four, five. And each time period is governed by a watch or ruling power. The watches in this case are three Islamic prophets, Ahmad or Muhammad, Ibrahim and Yusuf, and two, an two angels, uh, Jibrael the messenger and Israel the angel of death. With these Islamic prophets and angels, once again, each watch is either positive or negative, and it's also associated with the color. Yusuf and Ahmad are good, Israel and Ibrahim are bad, while Jibrael is sometimes good and sometimes bad. The colors are used are similar to before, Yusuf is yellow, Ahmad is white, Israel is black, Ibrahim is red, and Jibrail is green. Sometimes the two systems are combined, whereby the names of the Islamic watches are written in the same cells as the Hindu gods, such as in this manuscript. Uh, here you have morning, you have Ahmad and Maishwara, uh, forenoon you have Jibrail and Kala, uh, noon you have Ibrahim and Sri, uh, in the afternoon, you have Yusuf and Brahma. In the evening, you have Israel and uh, Vishnu. 
Now, there are other types of divinatory calendars with longer cycles. For example, this is a technique known as the rotating naga. So the naga is a deified serpent that is a major part of the beliefs of many cultures within South Asia and Southeast Asia. It is an underworld creature and is very strongly associated with rain and water. Its importance means that it is prevalent in the arts, appearing from early times such as in the monuments of Ancon Borobudur, and today still continues to be a common motif in architecture, metalwork, textiles and theatre. In the rotating Naga system, the Naga rotates four times a year, every three months, along the four cardinal points, north, east, south and west. When undertaking any activities, such as when traveling or building a house, it is advisable to consult the position of the Naga's body parts, especially its head, its back, its tail and its belly. You need to consult it uh, to determine whether it be favorable, favorable or otherwise in order to conduct these activities. Now the rotating Naga technique uh, could be found across many parts of South Asia, Southeast Asia, and also in East Asia, such as in this chart here. And it most probably, this technique most probably originated from India. Uh, this is an example of the rotating Naga system from Laos. It shows uh, four Nagas, each one representing each quarter of the year in which the Naga rotates. Now, in the Malay tradition, uh, in the majority of cases, the rotation of the Naga is as follows. Now, because the Malays use the Islamic lunar calendar, the rotating Naga technique has been adapted to fit into the Islamic calendrical system. So the cycle begins with the first three months of the Islamic calendar. During these three months, the Naga faces west, uh, its tail is in the east, uh, its belly points toward the south and its back towards the north. It then rotates anti-clockwise. So in four, months four, five and six, its head now faces the south and the tail towards the north. The next three months, its head is in the east and the final three months of the year is head is in the north. Now in the Malay manuscripts, the text of the rotating Naga is usually accompanied by an illustration of a single Naga, such as in this manuscript that was copied for Stanford Raffles in 1806. Now Raffles, best known for developing Singapore as a British port in 1819, was born in Jamaica to a Yorkshire family. During his 20 years in Southeast Asia, serving the East India Company, Raffles also collected a great amount of plant and animal specimens and ethnographic material. He collected Malay and Javanese manuscripts on a wide range of topics, either by obtaining the originals or, when not possible, employed scribes to have them copied. This manuscript commissioned by Raffles dated 1806 was most likely copied on the island of Penang, where Raffles had taken the post of assistant secretary the previous year. Now, although this um, manuscript is titled uh, The Laws of the Countries of Mancasa and Bugis, it actually includes a loud, large amount of material on talismans and divinatory techniques. For instance, it contains two prescriptions for exercising evil spirits. One using uh, sacred verses together with uh, these three hexagrams and the other involving uh, this figural image. For the section on the rotating Naga, the illustration of the Naga serpent in the manuscript is typical of the Malay depiction of the creature. Now in India, the, the Naga is depicted uh, in South Asia, the Naga is depicted more like cobras, but the Malay creature is more similar to a Chinese dragon, uh, but with a distinctive local uh, Southeast Asian iconography. Now, Chinese dragons tend to have a long body uh, with four legs. Uh, Western dragons uh, also have legs, but they also have wings, tend to have wings. However, the Malay Naga is different. Uh, here you can see the Naga's body is sort of short and scaly um, and does not have legs. 
It has a crest and an elaborate tail, and its mouth is open, uh, showing a row, two rows of white, uh, sharp teeth and a tongue uh, sticking out. Now, this iconography or visual representation of the Naga is also found in the art of other cultures in Southeast Asia, which indicates a shared uh, artistic heritage within the region. For example, this is the charm rotating Naga from a manuscript in Cambodia. Again, you can see the Naga creature uh, doesn't have any legs. Some of the depictions of the Naga in Malay manuscripts, however, show uh, more obvious Chinese artistic influences. In this example, uh, from a manuscript in the National Library of Malaysia dated 1894, probably from Kelantan, uh, located there, the Naga has been given a set of four legs and uh, feelers. These are very much typical attributes of the Chinese dragon, such as uh, you can see on the right. In such cases, the iconography of the animal was most likely based on architectural elements in Chinese temples or from depictions of the creatures on objects produced by Chinese craftsmen such as ceramics or textiles. Now to conclude, I've shown you a few examples of the types and topics, uh, types of topics and images that you find in Malay magic and divination manuscripts. They can tell us a lot about various aspects of Malay society, such as what type of supernatural beings inhabit the universe, what are the concerns of the people, and also on uh, Malay art itself. Also, as you may have noticed, many of these techniques and images are shared with other societies, both within Southeast Asia and outside Southeast Asia as well. They demonstrate that the literary and artistic tradition of Malay magic and divination did not exist in isolation, but was part of an extensive and long running transmission of ideas and knowledge between many cultures. I hope that I was able to highlight some of aspects of these complex systems of which there's still much to be learned. So thank you very much. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Farouk. That was absolutely fascinating. A, a really, uh, a really rich, wide ranging and, and also a lot of new material as well. So uh, really, really enjoyed that. Um, it's great to see uh, more study of, of this material from Southeast Asia. It's, uh, so much of the, the, the survey books of Islamic art seem to only cover the, the quote unquote traditional Islamic lands of, of sort of uh, Iran and the Middle East and, and then into India to push. Even India gets a, a bit of a short shrift and uh, yeah, really fascinating and showing that the practical aspects of these manuscripts. Um, I guess it's to, to start off a, a conversation, I, I was wondering if you could maybe say what um, what was the, the orthodox sort of ulema view of, of the use of magic and, and sort of going on from that? Um, how could the term magic be best understood? Because of course it has numerous uh, meanings in the modern English sense, uh, very few of which <laughs> apply to what you're talking about. So um, yeah, just how you would see, how you could best un explain how it's understood in the sort of the pre-modern Islamic and especially the Malay context. Uh, that's a very good question. Um... The, the, there were many um, opinions regarding this sort of material, uh, both within Southeast Asia and, and or other parts of the Islamic world as well. Uh, in Southeast Asia, within Malay society, uh, as I said, there's many uh, opinions regarding that. But sometimes you also find even religious officials also um, employing some of these techniques um, and material. Um, one way in which to best uh, explain it is basically all of them involve asking God for help. I and mean, most of them are not black magic as, uh, or sorcery. Most of them are basically asking God for help in healing uh, oneself or healing uh, a sick person or asking God for protection uh, or asking God for help in making decisions, for example, in divination, divinatory techniques often have, um, you know, often before you start doing something, you have to clean yourself and ask, recite certain prayers and ask God for help. Um, and also, you know, at the end of the day, God's the one who 
um, determines whether a patient heals or you know whether tells you whether you made the right decision or not whether you, you know what's the right decision for you to make so in many cases i would argue you know it could be argued that it's a form of popular piety you know uh, basically you're asking god for help so um that said there were some there are also some opinions which um um are not that um sort of okay with it so again there's many varieties there's many types of opinions regarding this matter and it's a very complex topic so no that's that's very helpful yes and it, yes it does it's an endless <laughs> endless yeah, discussion yeah. but it's good to get that that yeah. sense of it and i i really like the way you, you do sort of refer that there are islamic worlds and that this sort of monolithic almost othering approach that you know the sort of the entirety of, yeah. of eurasia and north africa and into South, <laughs> southeast asia can be viewed as a single world when clearly even europe can't be viewed as a single yeah. place but it's, even within these regions there's also varieties as well within the same region or even the same i don't know same area even the same town sometimes you have different uh different views or different practices within the same region so yeah is it's very complex um, um it's really interesting yeah. to see this sort of the more nuanced view and like you say there's the there's the specific local saints which are all venerated yes. in different ways so, and then, one thing that really jumped out it, it was when i started looking when you're showing those the calligrams um, yeah. to, to see one in the quran especially the the, the sumadang the java quran and mm -hmm. um, really interesting to see you know clearly you know, as Islamic as it comes in one context, you know, yeah. it's the Lion of Ali, but yeah. then, uh, you know, as a zoomorphic image in a Quran, it's like, oh, wow, what's, what's going on here? Um, and also in the, the mosque in Java, and it, it drew my, my mind to a much earlier, the Cheresi Kamba uh, Mosque in Kaman in Rajasthan, which is a early 13th century mosque, which has, um, there's a lot of mosques in that region that use spolia, uh, Hindu spolia with lots of figural right. and zoomorphic decoration, but there is a rare example where they haven't defaced the lions, lions and elephants. Um, and it's interesting to see. I just wondered if you could speak, because obviously it's this early period of Islamization, albeit whatever period in time it is, that the beginning of Islamization, there's this hybridity. And I just wondered if you could speak a little bit more about that use of the lions and something that fits with the original sort of the, or indigenous understanding of power and and protection, but then doesn't fit with the latest sort of thinking in terms of uh, an iconism in Islamic context. Yes, I mean, the lion images um, in Southeast Asia is quite interesting in a sense. Um, one thing which I haven't mentioned about the calligraphs of Lion Ali in Southeast Asia is that um, they're actually known as tigers. So, um, so they call the tiger of Ali rather than the lion of Ali because there are no lions in Southeast Asia. So the next nearest creature is the tiger. So in Southeast Asia, tigers are uh, believed not do not just have uh, powerful physical properties, but also um, have supernatural abilities. Um, so they often um, help magicians and shamans uh, with their work um, and also there's also belief in the word tiger, so tigers who can change shape into humans. So they're considered to be very powerful creatures. Um, so the use of the calligraphs of the Lion of Ali, as I mentioned, um, which replaces the Lion of Ali, might have something to do with that aspect as well, the pow power of the tiger uh, within the Southeast Asian context. So, um, so again, this is sort of a hybridity of sort of local belief and uh, belief in the Lion of Ali, which is part of a wider Islamic tradition. Uh, sort of a combination of that at play here. And it's a very interesting topic, which is, is quite interesting to research. How yeah, it's, it's fascinating. See, I, I know you said you've, you've looked at 100 manuscripts, which is obviously quite a lot, but uh, I can only imagine there's there's far, far more than that. Um, oh, you know, yes, it's yes. still a relatively understudied field, certainly in terms of literature and English. And um, what are your next sort of directions of research? Obviously, you've been publishing a lot of really interesting material recently, but what's your what's your next sort of focus or what are you working on now if this is sort of something you've done already? 
uh, there's still quite a lot to do with uh, the Malay magic and divination manuscripts. I mean, there's lots of topics within them. So I've, I'd like to explore the magic squares further because I've mentioned them to be used for childbirth, but also they can use it for other things like uh, one way in which you use magic squares is cry is called scrying, S-C-R-Y-I-N-G, which is sort of using a, it's a so a magic mirror. So you use a reflective surface to look at things, sort of like a crystal ball in a way. Um, so you use the magic square. Magic square can be used for that. Uh, so that's one thing which I'd like to look at further. Um, there's also other techniques uh, to do with astrology. Um, I don't know, there's just so much more to, to look at. I mean, I'm just barely scratching the surface basically here. No, I bet I can see there's a huge, there's a huge field and, and a lot of interest, in, you know, a lot of lot of ideas behind it. It's not just the material. Yes. And, and that's what brings me to one thing is it was really interesting that there's the practical aspect of these, you know, so, so many illustrated manuscripts are, are illustrating a story that they're, they're, they're essentially decorative, but, but these clearly sort of are, are manuals, or at least some of yeah. them are, are practical manuals. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how they might have been used because obviously when you've got a you know a lot of these sort of practices people already knew you know if you're a shaman yeah. you know the things if you're a potter you know how to make pots so just how you see them in terms of their actual function as as text and how, how they may have been used um that, that's a very interesting question yes so uh for some of these manuscripts well for, firstly as i mentioned at the beginning there's no two which are the same the each one as far as I can tell, each one is completely different to the other one in terms of content. Even if they have the same contents, they might be arranged differently. So it seems like they were, must have been you know, personalized to a particular individual. And often you often find, um, for example, in the one with the magic square for facilitating childbirth, you can see sort of, um, and also the one for the royal magician, you can see it's been heavily used. So it's not in very good condition. You can see thumb marks, uh, you know, when the, the users thumb through the, the manuscript. Um, so obviously they were used in the practical sense. And often, and also the contents are all practical. There's no theory. There's no theory of magic within them. It's all practical. This is what you need to do if you want this. This is what you need to do if you want to do that. Um, so they were very much uh, for for practical purposes. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, do you are there earlier or or in other sort of contexts texts that do deal a bit with the, the theory, or is that not really something that is is encapsulated in in that sort of codex format? Uh, I haven't come across uh, any of the any theory uh, well within the Malay uh, yeah. tradition. Yeah, uh, Malay tradition. Uh, also, just to mention that I think the certain practices which don't seem to be written down. Um, for example, I mentioned the royal magician, uh, the magic related to the royal magician, because um, these royal magicians also do other things uh, in relation to the state and kingship. Um, but those things do not seem to have been written down. So. Um, so possibly it seems like in sort of these cases, um, those techniques or incantations and so on were probably transmitted orally rather than um, in writing. No, and then what, one thing I've always thought, and it's, it's something I, I sort of struggle with and I know a lot of other people do is, um, you know, how to make this material, which I think you did a brilliant job of, of, of making it more accessible when a lot of the audience, the interested audience can't, Either read Arabic or indeed, you know, other other languages if it's if it's in you know it's in Javanese or something. Um, so just as a sort of more general uh, comment, you know, how how we sort of address this to 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 introduce it to a wider audience and, and give it sort of that that relevance and and, a, and an engagement, which isn't specific, you know, to, to the the manuscripts you were talking about, but obviously can apply to that as as much as other things. Um, I think. Well, quite a lot of the um, material which are contained in these manuscripts are, you know, are universal. I mean, most of them are to do 
not in just terms of the techniques and how they use like the magic square and the pentagram which you find all across the world but also in terms of the concerns like you know uh, when's a good time to get married or you know should i marry this person um, you know how do i heal uh, you know dizziness or um, constipation or whatever i mean they're all sort of universal uh, things how to protect um, yourself against enemies so the very universal themes um, so i think that's one way in which you can um, you know bring this to a broader audience and you know make comparisons and comparative material with uh, from other cultures that'd be quite uh, that'd be quite useful uh, in fact part of my research a main thrust of my research is to compare the malay material with those from other parts of the world not just within southeast asia but also Islamic world and, and, and so on. In fact, some of the Malay material, um, some of the techniques on divination can trace to, uh, to ancient Greece, basically. You know, it, it goes back to ancient Greece. Uh, so the transmission of these techniques and knowledge um, into the Malay world, I think is quite fascinating. Well, I just uh, just want to reiterate uh, uh, thanks from from York for you to giving the talk. We, we do look forward to uh, to bringing you up to York in person again for another talk, as uh, hopefully part of the Islamic Art Circle or maybe even the next uh, Festival of Ideas. But thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Yahya, for for giving that talk. Really excellent, fascinating, and I'm sure lots of people have their own questions which they can uh, pose to you. Um, the recording of this event will be available on the uh, festival YouTube channel and can be accessed from the watch again section of the festival website. And I'd just like to reiterate our thanks again for that wonderful lecture and we look forward to seeing you in person soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.